Sure, I'm Maggie Havman Gould. I'm the program director with Lighthouse Immigrant Advocates. Sarah, are you are Venos for Help. Uh, I'm the program director. And then I'm the advocacy director and managing attorney. The, the process has been very slow. We're still awaiting um, decisions in many of those asylum cases. I think we've had a total of 16? 26. 26. 26 okay, approval notices out of 300 and... 70? 360? Yeah. 360, 370 cases. So it's, it's slow going. If, if you're wanting to understand kind of the timeline of it, um, our first arrivals came in August of 2021, uh, where we kind of suddenly had 300 Afghans to help with their intake process. So that was just interviewing them, finding out how they left, why they left, what kind of um, difficulties and traumas they faced if they were part of certain religious groups, tribal groups that were especially targeted, um, women, journalists, their involvement with the military. Um, so that was our intake. Then we identified those that needed asylum. We did uh, these really long asylum appointments. So they were eight hour appointments with our office where we started a brand new asylum application in the morning and we had an almost completed application by the end of eight hours. Um, apart from that, we didn't have translations um, included. So we'd have to wait to get some of their documents translated. Then we ship off big uh, the paper ream boxes of um, blank paper that we got, we would fill them up with asylum applications and ship them off to USCIS. And typically once those are received, USCIS is supposed to respond within 150 days. Um, we had Decision all of our- Decision within 150 days, interview within 45 days. Yeah. Most of ours for the Afghan population, they actually extended it to two years. Uh, we made it within the one year um, guideline. And like we said, we've only had 26 approvals out of those so far. So the USCIS is very much beyond that 150 day requirement. And then I will say, in addition to that, the family reunification process has been incredibly slow. Um, it's really not happening at all. Um, I've only heard of one reunification case and that was for minor children. Um, otherwise, all of these different announcements about humanitarian parole for family members have not come to fruition. We've submitted applications, but we haven't heard anything from the Department of State, so families continue to be separated and at risk. Mm -hmm. So if you want to look at that in like, Sarah, Sarah's our managing attorney and kind of the legal brain, I bring it to like, what does that mean for real life people? <laughs> um, so some examples of that would be, we have a, you know an Afghan woman mm -hmm. that might be pregnant and is here with her spouse and really wants mom to come visit just, just for the pregnancy, just to help with having the baby, supporting mom, there is no U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan, so they can't like request permission to travel even to visit family. Um, there is the DS-4317, if I have it right. Um, so we submitted that for all of our Afghan clients um, who want to have family reunite. So that means maybe it's a soldier who worked with the U.S. military with wife and, and wife and kids had to remain. Um, so we have many stories of clients who um, were um, with their crew. Maybe they were a professional interpreter with the U.S. military and suddenly their commander said, don't go home, don't get your kids, don't get your wife, meet us at the airport, we're going out tonight. Yep. And so here are families, women uh, with their kids, but that could also be parents that are still left behind. Um, so we've submitted those DS-4317s requesting them to get reunited, but no word on those. And then we've also done some I-730s for the few uh, Afghans who have obtained that actual asylum approval so they can request um, the reunification of spouses, minor children, mm -hmm. and unmarried, no, just minor. No, under, just under minor 21. children under so 21. immediate relatives, and so I seven thirty is, is that's the family reunification petition, mm -hmm. um, specifically for people who have been granted asylum. So we can't make those um, petitions for those who haven't been approved for asylum, which is a lot that we're waiting on. Mm -hmm. So circling back, it's a very slow process, despite our mm -hmm. eight-hour appointments and such. There have been no no denials yet. We have had a few um, requests for second interviews, but that can be that can happen with different cases, but no denials yet. If it like just it is presumed that if they go back, they will be they will be persecuted if not if not 
murdered. Yeah. So. There, in, in fact, we've had to insure some clients um, that if they say, please don't send me back, I, I haven't heard back from um, my asylum application, what's going on, a lot of fear surrounding that, and we insure and uh, better clarify, we, you can't be sent back. Um, that's because of the conventions against, against torture. torture. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain safeguards, so if there is an Afghan national who is worried about being deported back in their situation, um, that would go against um, you know, basic basic law, we, we don't want them going back, they don't want to, um, and there's definitely a fear if they were to go back um, that they would face harm or death. Challenging. Um, so our, our asylum attorney, who's not here right now, he, he feels a lot of these calls. Um, in fact, we ended up getting him his own work cell phone because he was just needing to be on call for a lot of these folks who communicate oftentimes through WhatsApp, um, but it's just, it's persistent um, and it's the type of communication that comes out of desperation. Um, we're not getting great answers about things like re-parole in the United States. Their parole expired this month for, for many folks and so with the expiration of their, their parole status means expiration of, of authorization to work in the United States means the expiration of benefits that they might have been receiving through state agencies um, and so there's just a lot of fear surrounding their stability in the United States but then not getting in decisions about asylum um, despite promises to have decisions within 150 days all of these promises about family reunification and that not being honored um, so there's just a lot of uncertainty um, one sentiment that we're, we're, we're hearing quite often is just betrayal. Um, these are folks who devoted their lives to um, the U.S. military during that occupation and the hospitality that was, that was spilled out during that time towards um, you know, U.S. military and, um, and really just this desire to see democracy take hold in Afghanistan. And so there's the betrayal when, when that dollar agreement was signed and the Taliban was allowed to, to take over Afghanistan again. But then betrayal now that they're here in the United States and not receiving that same level of hospitality that they, they showed to U.S. occupation in Afghanistan. Um, and so it's hard to really reconcile that with folks. I mean, the only thing we can do as an organization is make sure that we are reciprocating that hospitality um, and doing our best to, to provide as much as much comfort and reassurances and at least communicate. Um, government hasn't been great about communicating. There hasn't been a lot of clarity in all of these procedures. Um, and so what we're trying to do is at least distill it in such a way that like, at least, at least they have as much information as we can give them. Us as an organization, when Afghans began coming over in August of 2021, um, it was a big learning curve for us just based on the populations that we've worked with. Currently, a lot of our staff are bilingual in English and Spanish based on local lakeshore um, communities. Um, and so suddenly we realized we needed Dari and Pashto speakers, which we definitely didn't have in-house. Um, uh, so that was a big adjustment, having interpreters and um, seeking out translators to help with documents, those kinds of things. Um, but also just culturally being aware of what's appropriate um, for uh, religious purposes, for um, different roles of women versus men, different greetings. Um, uh, that hospitality piece, I, I love Afghan culture in how welcoming and open and kind. I, all of us staff, I think, have been invited over by clients like, oh, you have to drop off papers, but um, please sit for tea, tell me how your family is, let me put out all of these snacks. Um, <laughs> It's, it's incredible and I think we've absorbed a lot of that too, like make sure you offer tea, make sure there, there are um, halal foods and snacks available. Um, so I think, I think as a whole we could continue to learn on those cultural practices and just make hospitality the focus. And so when we're looking at these asylum applications that aren't coming through and there's fear surrounding it and parole is expiring, um, we've tried our best to you know, communicate really well, so that's WhatsApp with our asylum attorney and staff, um, but it's also having interpreters available. It's um, 
I mean, we're both mothers and understanding uh, that families are separated and that's a really heavy thing. So it's coming from a trauma-informed perspective too and just saying, yeah, of course you're upset, of, of course you're fearful, of course you miss your family. Here's the information that we have. We've done um, videos um, in different languages too just mm -hmm. because there isn't um, the entire population may not be able to read subtitles or um, read written documents, so we try to put out as many um, video formats as we can um, to meet the different needs of the population um, to try and encourage and say, we get it, we're here for you, we're part of this big team, whatever decisions are made, um, we're going to try our best. So um, it's trying to make sure that they feel like they have partners, even though there are a lot of unknowns, and so that... Um, when we do get an approval notice, we um, have a staff member that gets to make that call and you can hear the cheers in the background <laughs> and like we get all choked up when those come through or when there's a big packet of, let's see, do we get one this week? Can we call someone with amazing news? Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely shared joy when those th come, things come through, but there's also shared grief in it not coming along as quickly as we want. and recognizing they just want to be safe, they just want to be with their family, they just want to have that stability that, um, that we should be able to offer. Mm -hmm.